good stuff after your name. So we're not going to do an interview. We're going to see if we can, well, it's like Talk battle, to one another. battle of the it's bands. It's a challenge. Yeah. So do you want to start the ball? No, 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 I want you to start. This is not starting no, very but, well. You know, for, first of all, a psycho, for me, the word psychoanalyst sounds so archaic. And I, I'm curious, in this world. Do I look young to you? Well, friend of Freud, <laughs> tell us why you still do this. And what, and you know, because uh, cognitive has sort of taken the front seat in uh, it, as far as therapy goes. But, I mean, the, the honest answer is that I actually do not think there's a lot of difference between the different kinds of therapies. Yeah. That, you know, it's a bit like, um, uh, you know, you kind of go into a supermarket and there are lots of different washing powders and some of them have this some label. Some of them cost 200 pounds. Some of them cost very expensive. Some of them have new on it, you know, <laughs> new, new washes whiter. You know, so you take that off because this will certainly be, there must be something new in it. So, but actually all of them have soap in it. Uh, ultimately, so actually there's not a lot of difference. So I, I mean, my own, uh, over 35 years of working in this field, my sense is that people get better uh, for the same reason. There are not 1,246 different reasons for getting better, uh, although there are 1,246 different kinds of psychotherapies. Okay, how do you know when they're better? What's uh, better mean? You're interviewing me. I thought no, you weren't going to interview me. Okay, when they don't want to hear it, they'll put yes. up their hands. Oh, right. What are you paying the 200 pounds or the 140 or the 25 I, I, pounds I for? How, how do you know no, how much I know, I charge? No, I know, I you're know. You know. You're not like a hooker, no, I no, know. No. <laughs> but what, what's better? How do you know when somebody's cooked? But, I mean, you know, how do you know that... How, how do you know that uh, uh, somebody's not well? I mean, yeah, they... they, they uh, on the whole, it depends on the disorder they have. So if you are, for example, depressed, you know it pretty quickly. Uh, you, um, usually you are, you are in the help-seeking group. If you are, on the other hand, if you've got like obsessive-compulsive disorder or you are very anxious, actually the time lag between you developing the problem of, say, having panic attacks and you seeking help can be something like three or four years. So you just live with it, um, which is really a tragedy, which is why, actually, is why we're doing this thing. Because, you know, I don't know how many of you out there, you know, I, I put my hand up, you know, I have anxiety, you know, now particularly. Really? Yeah, I do it terrible, breathe, yeah. Breathe, breathe. <laughs> do, you, and do, you, do you have a disorder? I mean, it was, it was yourself? Because I personally wouldn't see a therapist unless they had my disorder. <laughs> not necessarily I, I, mine, I, I, but a disorder. Exactly, yeah. yeah no, I, not mine. No, no, no. no. There's a gender difference as well. <laughs> anyway, but, the, but no, I, I, I was, um, I'm a service user, uh, and I started out my career in mental health as a service user. Um, and uh, I was uh, kind of dropped into this country at the age of uh, 16, and uh, I didn't speak the language very well, and... Uh, uh, I had only one skill, which is I could play soccer, and uh, that was valued in the secondary modern school that I went to. But other than that, I was not regarded as worthy of anyone's friendship. And uh, who told you that? They, they didn't talk to me, which was a little what? clue. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, um, uh, so I was very lonely, and I was very unhappy, and I got very depressed, and I was. Um, thinking about suicide and uh, I uh, had planned how I was going to kill myself and you know I had the whole you know what uh, age are we talking about uh, I was kind of like uh, kind of 16 17 18 you know these were the, by 18 it started getting better but I went then went uh, to that uh, the Anna Freud Center um, uh, that time it was called the Hampstead Clinic and I had uh, uh, the therapy there, the kind of intensive psychotherapy, and um, um, uh, I got better. Uh, and uh, it was really, really, really helpful. Um, and uh, I stopped having suicidal thoughts, I stopped being depressed, I uh, still didn't have any friends, but that I've now learned to recognize was just me more than the <laughs> disorder. So. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, um, I think it's really important um, that 
in my case, um, that if you are adolescent and you have depression, which is very common, that's when it's, that's the onset is, that you seek help then. Because like with any disorder, um, the, any, like any, any organ in the body, uh, the longer it's yeah. diseased, um, uh, the more it gets used to being diseased and the more difficult it is to change it. So it's like, you know, it's like um, my knee, you know, uh, I, I had uh, twisted it some years ago and it's still not quite the same. Um, uh, if you have a kidney infection, it's the same. Uh, you know, kidney infection it never recovers completely. Yeah, people, but, but people are so afraid, especially kids. <clears throat> That's because I do, he forgot to mention, I do a show uh, that was based on it started off live at the Priory just because it was so audacious. I'll just give a little back, background because that's not really what I do uh, uh, for a living. So uh, I'm leading into this. I'm not segueing off you. The reason I um, am mentioning it is so I did a show for, uh, I wouldn't have told anybody I had mental illness, but Comic Relief outed me because they, they asked for, for, to take a picture for their mental health campaign and they smeared it all over London on uh, tube stations and with this picture of me, gigantic, saying, this woman has mental illness, please help her. So that's how it started. So I thought, I'm going to write a show and make that look like it's my publicity poster. <laughs> so then I, I, I toured mental inst can you hear me? I toured mental institutions for two years. So it started at the Priory and then it went to National Health. And the audience in the second half could ask questions. Because, you know, and, and P.S., uh, you know, there was no question that I was talking down to them because if somebody's one in four, that we can smell each other. So they knew I wasn't, you know, and they'd come in slightly, sometimes catatonic, but by the time I'd finish, they'd ask the most remarkable questions. And then when it went into the West End and I've been in Australia and L.A., same questions. So one of the main questions always is, I'm too scared to take these drugs. What do they do? You know, and part of this thing is, sorry, just to bring it back about tonight, is that uh, nobody has any place to talk about this stuff. And even the caregivers are pulling out their hair because they have it just as hard. Because in my show, I say I was told by somebody to perk up, perk up, because I, I didn't think of that. Um, so, so we have nowhere to go. So uh, this is sort of, I'm just bringing it back, why we're starting to gonna have walk-in centers, because Alcoholics Anonymous do. And there's more of us than that, you know. And they organized it, and I always think, how'd they do that? Because they're drunks. <laughs> but so the big question is: so this is the baby, you know, of where people could meet. It wouldn't always be us talking. Um, I, I'd like to be there because I did when I opened the doors, and when I'm do in the theaters, we open it once a week during the day, and I brought Peter in to talk to the public. But then we brought in a lot of volunteers from Sane who can help individuals, because you have nowhere else to go. Or I never did, and I always wanted to meet my own people, because then I would have known I wasn't making it up. So back to drugs, the big question is, um, people are, you know, if you have cancer, they jump right into chemotherapy, most, and that's pretty archaic, and so are, um, so are antidepressants, real archaic, but it's all we've got. So why is it that we're in a society where, it's true, if you can stop a kid, from having more than, you know, after the first episode, he might not slip into the episodic life that he's destined for. So, you know, why aren't people trained to say, because you can see sickness in the eyes, just as like you can feel a head for temperature. We can spot each other. So a great tragedy is that teachers don't go, wait a minute, this one isn't in a bad mood, this one's sick, and get him somewhere, because I wish they did that to me, so. Why is it that people are so afraid of taking a drug? I, Maybe you, know, you want to answer that. Sorry. Do you I, I, I think uh, people don't, don't like their minds being um, messed with, is what they feel. They want to be in control of their minds. But are you in control when you're having chemotherapy? Uh, they, but they mind less about uh, uh, their body than they mind about their mind. Why? But uh, that's, that's the nature of the human mind. It minds being messed about. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it was created to be independent of uh, everything that goes on around it. That's why uh, as soon as um, uh, 
we know that the mind evolved, so did uh, the capacity to step beyond the body. So people started doing cave paintings and uh, such like because they started to transcend their physical existence. So taking drugs is bringing people back oh, that, yeah, to it, it kind of collapsing that. into your body. That the, now, what the interesting question is, they like taking certain drugs. <laughs> it's just other drugs they don't like taking. So alcohol seems to do really well. Uh, it's marketing. Uh, yeah, it, it is, or something. You know, and tobacco does really well as well. It's, uh, coffee does a fair trade too, but... Uh, uh, but also, we can never believe that we're sick. You know, people, if they... Uh, does it, you know, do, because I'm successful, and thanks very much, because that makes me even sicker when I get sick. You know, the abusive voice starts, yeah, well, you white person, you know, with the food in your mouth, why do you have depression? And that's part of the sickness, is that it's the shame on top of the shame. You know, if I had any other illness, I'd get sympathy cards. Mm -hmm. So, um... So why is it that people don't send sympathy cards to somebody who's got... Well, that was interesting, what you said, is that, the, that we, in, a, in a sense, when we started to come out of our minds, yeah. we lost our bodies. Yeah. And it was, I was reading a book, to, it, it, it was okay for a while, you know, uh, where yeah. you had a community and you had, like, the local priest and you had, you know, this is how much food you needed to feed your family. But now, because it, it's too much incoming, you know, I, I was in Sydney last week, Everywhere I went, I had to know about what happened in Ohio. You, you know, there was a, yeah. every, it was in the air. And I thought, this is making me crazy. I, I, when am I going to fly to Ohio? Then, of course, it got replaced by Woolwich. We, are we supposed to know? Because we're in high levels of fear when we hear it. Our insides don't know, you know, that it's not around the corner. So it's not anymore one in four. I think now, if you really measured everybody's where their amygdala is, we're pretty switched on most of the time. And I don't know if you agree, the problem now is we have no more breaks. Mm. There's no more breaks except for alcohol. Yeah. Well, yeah. And so that, let's that, have yeah. a few minutes of silence yeah. <laughs> for alcohol. Okay. No, but is that why the drug industry is, is thriving? Because we are, we're, a lot of us, in a high, a high state of alarm. Yeah, I mean, the interesting thing is that actually, um, if we had better treatments for uh, mental disorder in terms of uh, pharmacotherapy than we do. And, and we do have some good treatments. I'm not, I'm not trying to say that all treatments, all pharmacotherapy is bad, but what gets prescribed most to most of the people is actually something that's completely ineffective. So getting selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors gets probably to be effective if you have very severe depression, but actually most of the prescriptions goes to people who have mild to moderate depression, for whom it works as a placebo. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a problem, uh, because you go to your GP and you say, I'm feeling depressed, and the GP says, what can I do about that? You know, uh, I'm not you, trained in yeah, it in any way, but I'm not telling you that. that. Okay, but you know, but let, let me give you some, you know, give me a prescription, this might help. And people actually then, uh, take the, I mean, the you, know, you, know, you know how many um, the modal number of pills the, the, kind of, the most frequent number of pills taken by somebody who's prescribed an antidepressant is one so you know they take one pill and then that's it because you know, they didn't agree with maybe two or three very few people, a very small minority actually take the full course but it's a good thing or a bad thing. I'm not saying it's a good thing or a bad thing, but it's a real thing. Uh, and uh, um, my own feeling is uh, that there is so much that we can do for ourselves, for each other, um, to make us less vulnerable to depression and less vulnerable to anxiety. Uh, we can live a different kind of life. We can... Uh, how? But that's okay, but you tell me how. Okay. Well, you wrote what's a whole your book version? about it. It was a brilliant book. I wrote book. a book about it. Hey, come on, you tell me. Well, we, you have tell, we got to that? Buy the book? Well, no, because I was sick of running to a shrink and paying that kind of yeah. money. Um, but just, you tell me where I'm wrong. I think that, that before we go into drugs, I thought, you know, shrinks are, were really helpful in the beginning when your life is just chaotic mm -hmm. and you need somebody to help you put the story together. 
because you know a lot of us we can't remember what's real and what's not especially when your parents are so disturbed you assume that everybody's parents are you know screaming from the balcony um, so you know the shrink is a good kind of person to tell your story to and they're trained to be you know open and won't punish you like mommy did so once you have the story right if you keep going for the next 30 years and now having you know I was fascinated with the brain because this is the new frontier you know you couldn't look in 20 years ago is that you start to embed a story so you become that story and you become as stereotyped you know and as inflexible as somebody who's got a total pathology mm -hmm. yes I'm always a victim yes I'm a so it seems that for me psychotherapy or a lot of therapy just solidifies the image you have of yourself and I think the idea is to crack it open and say there's infinite possibilities here. So I'm confused as to how you, you know, why whenever I went, I had to repeat that story over and over and over again. It, and it was good for the first five years. But then, you know, I'm tired already. I know what's coming, why do I have to tell you? Do you mean that uh, Sorry, you, had I, to tell, you had to tell the same person the same story again and again, or you told different people? Different, you know. Different shrinks. Yeah. They would all ask the same question. Yeah, and eventually um, I, I became a fabrication of my story. Yeah. And that, did, that didn't heal me. I mean, that, that's me. the tragedy that can happen. Yeah. I, 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 it's appalling. It's yeah. bad. So how do you, does somebody have a eureka moment when you're their shrink and say, oh my God, I've just, what are they looking for? It's gradual, isn't it? I mean, everybody yeah. wants to know what are you supposed to get from a shrink? I mean, what I think is most important, and that as I've kind of got uh, um, uh, kind of older and uh, probably less wise, I, uh, the sense that I have is that the most important thing that you can get from a shrink is someone who uh, uh, believes you and sees the world from your point of view. So you and have a witness. It. That you have a witness to your experience and you're not alone. One of the things that I have... Uh, in almost all the people that I've worked with, I find a kind of consistent theme is a sense of isolation. That they feel that on their own. And there's nobody who can really... And they are there with uh, uh, their partner, their parents, their children, and yet they feel alone. Uh, and uh, because they don't feel that anybody can really see the world from their point of view. Yeah. And if you've got a good shrink, I'm not saying there are many of them around. Uh, I've seen three here, but uh, the, you know, if you've got a good shrink... Put up your hands, because yes. I'd like to find one. Yeah, yes. <laughs> uh, uh, but if you've got a good shrink, it's, it's someone who can actually tune in to you and see you from your perspective to see the world the way that you see it. And that, I think, restores the sense of agency that you have lost, the sense of belief in yourself, that what really has made you feel so isolated in, in a social right. world. I mean, that's what I now believe. That's the soap. But, you know, when, you, when I was institutionalized and I saw the whites of the eyes of the other yeah. people who had what I had, I knew they felt how I felt. And that, it, uh, maybe that was the placebo. I didn't, by then, I don't even know if I needed the drugs. But the minute, and again, that's the reason for the walk-in things. Yeah. If I could see somebody who looked like me, you know, because we're also, we're the best actors in the world, you know, so much cocktail chatter, and I just want to find my tribe. Mm -hmm. Because the minute you slap eyes on them, you feel, okay, we don't have to, no more small talk. I, I'm inside your body and I know. Because the, if I have one more person ask me, well, why should I be impatient? If depression is because yeah, my cat left town, so I'm really depressed. Why did we choose this? And I go, read my lips. It's when you're a block of cement, right? Swimming, tennis playing, eating food and nutrition will not help you when you are depressed. You're not even sad, you're dead. You know, if somebody could put that, so we don't have to ask over and over again, oh, you're depressed, pull yourself out of it. And I would say, you have cancer, pull yourself out of it. If we could get that established, I think that would help with the stigma. There's nothing that I'd like more than that. Yeah. I mean, for myself, but not just for myself. I think for 
if it could be accepted, if we could live in a world where it was accepted that people had experiences that were literally unbearable, and that, that we could recognize, we could bear to recognize in someone else that unbearable experience, then I think is, that I think is the cause of the stigma. You just can't, you know, it's like you see someone with uh, um, uh, a shaved head or whatever it is. But they get sympathy cards, you know, and they get flowers now. I'm not saying if it's a, it's a battle to the, you know, thing. Yeah. But if you say you're depressed, nothing. You know, and especially if you're doing all right, really nothing, you know. There's even anger. Why you? Um, anyway, that's where we are. You know, we can yib on it about all we want, but that's where we are right now. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that gets us back to what, uh, what can, I mean, given that there's no way, that if, if the tribe is one in four, okay, yeah. uh, there's no way that, you know, the rest of the, can be uh, act as shrinks for uh, the one in four. It can't, it, that's not a model that, that could ever work. We need a different model. How can we well, help people help themselves? Th but they need to meet, you know. But it's that's the part same of way the answer. AA worked, yeah. is that you need to have your people. And, and caregivers will find their own vocabulary because I can't do it and you shouldn't read it in a book. Because it'll counteract the sense of being alone. Yes. But that's the real sickness, is that yeah. it's the shame. And uh, what, uh, before we go on, but I, I said, uh, in my lifetime, the whole gay movement, we should learn from them, went from hiding in the closet to now they're everywhere. You know, and they had their parades, and maybe we could get the depressives together, yeah. or the one in four, and we could take their old high heels, well, what color do you think we and should their rainbows, yeah. and they could march with pitchforks. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I might do, my book comes out on Thursday, yeah. I might have a gathering in Hyde Park at two in the afternoon, and we march to Parliament, the way the suffragettes once did, and said, well, you know, the problem is in the law is where the real stigma is. Usually if they, on your CV, they ask if you have mental illness. Yeah. Well, good luck getting that job. So it's, stigma isn't just even people treating you like, you know, um, an object to fear. Mm. It's, it's in the workplace, too. It's pretty bad. I, and I never would have told anybody I had depression because I would have been out, out of my job. Ooh. Well, people wouldn't have given you contracts. And no contracts, because what if you go nuts in the middle of something? It mm -hmm. was unheard of then anyway. Because Stephen Fry did go nuts once, and boy, was his reputation soiled. Yeah. He ran away in the middle of a play. And of course, every newspaper went, you know, he's gotten over it, he's doing all right. But it, it's ended careers. So anyway, do you want to ask some questions at this point? Anybody got something? Yeah, hi. Hi. Do you mind me swinging? No, 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 not at all. There's, there's an aspect of depression, which you talked about, that, that you know, that, that there's infinite opportunities. But the, the word depression, surely that just kind of gets those opportunities and brings them close and puts them under the leg, under the umbrella of depression. With my clients, I try to talk to them about the incidents that have actually happened in their life and to leave the label of depression mm. to one side. because. It's restricted, I find. Now, I, I do, I'm very aware that there's a difference between sadness and clinical depression. But again, you know, if we kind of, if we're seeing somebody, and you talk about becoming the label, you talk about becoming, you know, the story, you know, and if we kind of see them and, and, and go with the label of depression, surely we're kind of... Yeah, it's like, them in the I'm a feminist, I'm an alcoholic, I'm a Jew, you know, that's why we're in trouble in the world. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, you say that you get the story leading up. Part of the thing of, of studying neuroscience is so we don't, it's nature and nurture. So somebody could have parents that are maniacs and they come out resilient. So that's another thing I think that adds to the stigmas. Who knows? Because somebody will say, well, you know, look at me. I'm in the trenches and I'm perfectly fine. And this is another thing that I think drives us nuts is Richard Branson can, you know, sleep two hours and jump from an airplane. For the next guy, he doesn't know, it's going to make him sick. And by the way, Richard Branson is nuts. But we hold these people up, you know, who sleep two hours, who go, you know, who do these extraordinary things. Mm. You know, and, and, and so we all feel, I think, inferior, don't, don't you? No matter how many things you have after your name. 
Isn't there a sense of, um, it's never good enough? Do you have the critical voice? Because <laughs> everybody does. Yeah, of course you do. Yeah. And does it say the same thing mine says? I d never listened to yours. But, no. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, but, but, but I think... People want to know, does everybody have the critical voice? I mean, everybody has the critical voice. Yeah. And just a question of how loud it is and how much you focus on it. Uh, but, you know, I get... Uh, I mean, my wife thinks that uh, I have chronic depression. Uh, all the I, time. Yeah, exactly. It's just there all the time. I, I personally don't agree with her. I think it's really bad when she's nasty to me. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, uh, the issue I think that you raise um, uh, is uh, a very real one. Um, and I think it's really what exactly uh, what Ruby was saying earlier. Are we making things worse for people or better by trying to help them? And, you know, and uh, I used to think that, you know, psychotherapy may never work, but this doesn't do any harm. I now think that actually it can do harm. When can it do harm? Um, I mean, you know, when you actually, uh, um, exactly the way that you were talking about it, Ruby, you get people to be overly reflective, and you get their head, you know, it's, like, it likes, it's like a wheel spinning in sand. You start getting them thinking and thinking and thinking and thinking, not going anywhere with it. Yeah. And the, gradually it gets deeper and deeper into the sand, and then they get completely stuck. And they need a crane a to be lifted out yeah. of it. Yeah, yeah that's, uh, that's why I went into, uh, well, when I heard about mindfulness, yeah. I, because I was, A, didn't want to pay anymore, being Jewish, and B, um, I wanted to, I know that the next zeitgeist, I don't know, is about self-regulation. Because A, nobody has the money anymore, B, the hospitals are shutting, and C, people are sick of you know, the, these generic drugs. So I thought, what's the next wave? And uh, at least, it doesn't have to be mindfulness, but some way of being able to judge when I'm going toward a tipping point and feeling the little pitter-patter before I'm hit with the full tidal wave. Because that's what's so insidious about mental illness, is that you haven't got a spare brain to tell you something's wrong. It's just your brain, so I, have to, I had to ask a friend of mine if I looked crazy, and she said yes. Because I wouldn't have known, it's so slow. You just assume, oh, this is the new me. So I'm gonna imitate who I remember I was, and it becomes grotesque. Mm -hmm. um, it was grotesque, but nobody notices. You know, they just, as long as you're the life of the party, even though you're going down the tubes. But, um, but the thing about uh, the self-regulation is, you're, the, the most important thing is to stop the rumination. You know, our, our, our brains aren't equipped to think our way out of an emotional problem. They're really equipped to solve a real problem. Like, how do we build this building? How do we get out of the caves? How do we build, you know, this hardship? How do we... But once it comes to figuring out emotional, uh, we, we just haven't got, the, we haven't got the bandwidth. We don't know how to do that. And that's why maybe you go to a shrink saying, you talk, I'm so sick of hearing myself. Yeah, I mean, yes and no. I mean, I, what I, I think that none of us have a mind because suddenly, one, you know, I've never met a kid who one morning just woke up and said, Mom? I think, therefore I am. It just doesn't happen like that. We don't discover our minds. What, what I think happens in reality, that in development, somebody who is attentive to us discovers us as a mind. You know, it becomes, you know, so that, you know, I think because someone thinks of me as thinking is much, kind of, much closer to the truth. So I think no wonder that when we are in trouble, uh, when we've kind of lost... Uh, some kind of calibration over what's going on in our mind, we go and talk to somebody else. And that probably happened even before Freud. Uh, people used to talk you think? to him. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't charge as much before no. Freud. But uh, uh, it became a, you know, commercially a far better proposition. But uh, I think it's, it's, there is something that you were saying about seeing the white of the eyes of the other people who have mental health. You want to bring people together in a, uh, some kind of uh, conclave, you know, who all have mental, 
because there's something about recovering our minds through a relationship. And one thing that we know about depression is that, you know, that uh, whether you have mild depression, moderate depression, or severe depression, if you have a bad relationship associated with that depression, you're much less likely to recover, uh, uh, particularly if you're a woman. Uh, seems what to do you mean, if you have a partner? If you have a bad relationship, it can be with your parent, oh, right. it can be with your child, it can be with your partner, bad human it's relationship. In, in a, in a, in well, that's why I say when people say, what do I say? I say, the first thing I do if my kid has it is, where's the walk-in center, but find some group. Yeah. I mean, you know, you know how to locate something on eBay, find a group. Yeah. But of course, you can't until it's too late, then you're in an institution. But to me, the institution was the happiest time of my life. You know, I go and Tell sometimes and smell yeah. the walls. Because I finally found people that had the same thing. Yeah. Well, I told you that. Um, and, then, and then the kind of, and then the cortisol comes down, because you're not scared of putting on a front that everything's okay. But I think this is, again, four and four. I think the human situation is such that we're really more isolated. Even though we're talking to a wider audience, there's less one-to-one. -one. And certainly you don't want to admit that anything's wrong. I, I don't know why. I guess it's maybe something primitive, like at the at the watering hole, if one of the animals is starting to, you, you know, limp, the rest of the herd move away. <laughs> so that's maybe the stigma. It's like something's wrong with you. I'm out of here. They still smile, but you're gone. Whereas I would really, I like the the the, the one that's going down, but maybe that's my illness. But you know, I'm so sick of people that are having a nice day. Really, I'm not interested at all. I don't know what you, well, you wouldn't make a living if you liked it. <laughs> Sorry, there's... I think that's one of the symptoms of depression is the inability to ask about water recap when people around you. Oh, what are you saying that... I wonder if one of the <coughs> symptoms of depression or something that comes with depression is the inability to even see the people around you or to reach out. Yeah, one of the symptoms of depression is... the a very difficult thing to be overcome. And I imagine for someone trying to find a turning point, that would be one of the things they would need to realise is that somehow there were people around them and back the water and hold the wall. Yeah. But that, that's, just, that's, that's the bitch of it too, is that we, everybody hunkers mm -hmm. alone. But you see, if we had the walk-in centers, you'd have a buddy system the way the alcoholics do, and you'd have somebody who says, you know, I, I know Helena Bottoms Carter's mother did this. Mm -hmm. She was, she's a shrink. And she, when she had depression, I thought this was brilliant, um, to show the kids. She just about had the strength. She had a little um, a pin that was a, a, like a porcupine. And when she felt, you know, the red mist coming over, she pointed down and the kids would know, stay away. And when she got better, she'd go, you know, when it would point up again. So that everybody around her would know how to modulate. I know I'm not saying what you, because I, I tried to develop that website for even people who can't get out of bed. I mean, unless we have the public meeting, you gotta find somebody who will know when you're going down, because we still don't know when we are. But I have a friend where I go, how are the eyes? We check each other's eyes. Now that's the closest bond you can have. And she says, you're going down. Then you can do things about it. But once you're in bed and you haven't got a contact, that's another thing that exasperates it. Sorry? Yeah? Someone asked about um, stigma. When you talk about um, you know, stigma of someone who's got mental illness and so on. Why is mental illness um, like sort of the lowest of the low in society? Because people have lots and lots of problems. Why is me mental illness the one that no one will admit to and no one wants to have and no one can seem to have? Why, why is it? Do you want us to answer? Is there anybody in here who has an answer? Anybody? some therapists which they don't necessarily understand or really want to do. 
So in terms of what you think of what your options might be, they are incredibly limited. And if you don't want to take some drugs, then, and really also we live in a society where we want a quick fix. So we want something that's just gonna, okay, there we go, you know, you take the pill and there I'm fixed. And there isn't a sense of, actually, mental health issues involve an incredible amount of work to deal with and live with and, you know, and manage and tell everybody and to help everybody else to deal with you. And, you know, so it's kind of, all in all, it's much easier, I think, just to, go, oh, do you know what, I'm not, I'm just I'm not going there. In bed. <laughs> like, you know, or feel anxious and, you know, take some beta blockers or whatever it is that you're trying to manage, I think, because our, it, I don't think it's so much mental health awareness, it's mental health kind of health awareness. Like, what you do, nobody really knows, so kind of, I think it, do nothing. <laughs> it comes back to your separation of the mind and the body. Everybody can take that, you know, okay, you lose a limb or something, yeah, well, but this is that. the mothership. You can see it. Yeah. You can see that some, if someone's ill, you can see that they're ill, you can see that they, you know, might have a broken leg or whatever. It's mental health is like, whoa, <laughs> who knows what's going on in that, so it's easier to kind of. But, but I think if we stop seeing them separately, mind and brain, it would help. You know, if we saw the brain similar to the liver, you know, if you get a liver disease and you cure it, you know, with whatever it takes. And I don't see why mental health is any different it, it isn't, but it, it, sorry, it's just seen, what? That's how it's seen, I think. I don't think it is different. It isn't different, but it it's the, the dean of Oxford was at this uh, gig I was, and he said if the money spent on, uh, I think the, the cancer or whatever cancer, we'll what, cancer. was spent on m mental illness on the brain, no, it's not a sexy charity, not sexy at all, because we got no ribbons. Um, I'm not complaining, but you know, but uh, if the money was spent, we no, we wouldn't have depression. We would have dealt with it. That that's why we're in the dark ages here. And yet, I'm always trying to say, before we build playgrounds for the underprivileged or send people up to the Arctic to sew up, you know, the icebergs, all of this comes from us. It's all this is this little piece's fault, not because you have a liver disease, but something is sick in us, or the way we see the world. And until we fix this, everything's going to fall to shit. They'll always, there'll be crime. Yeah. Well, you know, yeah. But if you have mental, if you have mental illness, um, you are going to die 17 years before someone who doesn't have mental illness, uh, on average. Uh, so your life is shortened by 17 years. It's quite a lot. It's a lot at my age. Less. Uh, <laughs> Uh, earlier on, but you got uh, three minutes. Yeah. <laughs> I know I'm, <laughs> I'm working hard, uh, but uh, I think uh, there's a real issue um, about uh, having an illness that there is no answer to. I mean, cancer used to be exactly the same as uh, mental illness 50 years ago, 60 years ago. It was an incredible. It was incredible shame associated with having cancer. It was uh, something that you then tell anyone, and it was it was a, a, a and then a massive amount of money, as uh, um, Ruby says, was injected in it, and the problem is gradually being solved. It, we are getting further. The, the the burden, the amount of money that society spends on cancer is uh, about uh, uh, 16 uh, uh, billion. Uh, for mental it's 26 billion. It, mental illness is actually much more expensive, much more burdensome than either cardiovascular disease or uh, cancer. But the amount of money that we spend on research is a fraction of either of those two. So I mean, what uh, Ruby is saying is absolutely right. And the, the answer to that has to be uh, because we are, um, we are just so frightened of anyone whose mind is out of their control. Um, that, you know, I, I had relatives, uh, I don't think that's so prevalent now, but relatives who were terrified of actually meeting somebody who was mentally ill in case they might do something. 
I mean, God, you know, people are really scared. There are a lot of people around who might do something. Uh, but uh, if someone's mind is out of control, you really can't afford to be too close to them. And going back to your lame, uh, what was it, what, animal verbi, in, in your analogy of the watering hole? Uh, oh, yeah, the, the wildebeest. Yeah, wildebeest, yeah. okay. I didn't say that, but I thought that's of That's what you thought of, yeah. Well, that's good. <laughs> Don't you think this whole realm is just so, like, limiting in terms of, like, I've, like, trained in yoga, for example, but I've also been seizuring from it in my youth. Like, there's a fact of, like, when I listened to Radio 4 last year, I'll always remember, and it said, like, in the States, a 12-year-old was being prescribed um, antidepressants, okay? I went to an all-girls boarding school where a lot of the kids there had lost parents. They didn't have one uh, counsellor for a lot of these kids. So, in therefore, if it was like this whole realm of like push, push, pushing the antidepressants, half of the kids there would have been on there, on the stuff. And it's the fact that the body is an ever-evolving thing, and it's basically... Um, Giving, you know, obviously GlaxoSmithKline isn't about to back like a whole realm of like, let's do breathing techniques, let's take a dog out for a walk or something, let's get away from this realm of wallowing and shit and like literally just try and get a break from your head. Like honestly, I think that has such a thing that it needs some kind of backing, but there isn't, there no. isn't the funding for that. And that is like, so like if you turn on Radio 4, and you see that they're um, like directing the collective consciousness and stuff. There's not much cheerful stuff a lot of the time that is actually spoken about on that. You could come away from that going, oh my god, do you know what I mean? Like you're depressed just from like listening to women's hour. <laughs> it's like literally, I think the whole realm in terms of giving the brain a break isn't there isn't enough out there. That's it's actually um, it's a disservice to humanity. Yeah, that's, you're right on the button. Yeah, I, I completely, I mean, that's why I got interested in what I got interested in, is that, num and, and you, for some people, it's going to be different for everybody. I'm not an evangelist, you, you know, but the, the important thing is to stop it somehow. You will always have the critical voice. You know, I wrote that in, that is in, that's from a gift from evolution, because that makes you vigilant if you had, Oh, what a remarkable job I'm doing, and may I say how attractive I look. You'd be hit by a car. So we, evolution has given us this. It's given us drive. It's given us the addiction to do better, right? But now we're, it's, too, it's too much. You know, and so, but nobody knows. That. The braking systems are these things of getting into your body, of dealing with the rumination, maybe going under the bullets, of... Um, you know, I do mindfulness. There's no, I'm not waving crystals. I'm not worshiping the fat guy. But if you look in an fMRI scanner, you can see that if I'm concentrating, let's say, of, of senses in my body, like you would do, in, like concentrating on the feel of the chair or my feet on the ground, the amygdala, the alarm button, automatically goes down. You can trick your body now. It's all, this information is researched, but we're still reading the secret. We're in 2013, and the books that sell are the ones that say, I just appear with a smile on your face and think about your inner angel. Although and that's why we're screwed. Um, from the secret <laughs> is where attention goes, energy flows, and that's completely true. So it is the fact that That's completely true. You in a shrink's chair for like two hours, literally wallowing, and they're not necessarily going to embalm it yet. You could go and do a cognitive behavioral therapy <coughs> course, which is really good. For giving that kind of stand back and let's truly like weigh up and judge what's going on. But then, like, let's say, for example, Eckhart Tolle did a thing on like calling dogs um, the defense, the guardians of being, yeah, because they're not anything to do with this worldly, um, like, you know. You've lost me now on the dogs. Side, critical side to the brain that's being like, um, you know, backed up by all this kind of human pushy pushy stuff like PRing for antidepressants. You better take this and like dumb yourself down kind of thing. And or like just go and try something new. Uh, I'm, I'm going to put, uh, just, I agree with you that where your attention is, is where your mind is. That, of course. 
but we, nobody's teach, giving you the ability to pull your attention and put it where you want it. And that really is the human condition. Okay, we weren't trained to do that. They say to kids, pay attention, but nobody knows what attention is. Um, but as far as uh, saying don't take antidepressants, if I stop now, goodbye world. So I'd never say don't take, it's all we've got. Yeah. I mean like options, if it is so sure. bad, you can take but the, but the, if you start giving people too many options, we're, we're in a, you know, there's every self-help book, to me, is the most dangerous minefield you could go into. I, I mean, I, I, honestly, positive feeling good about yourself would drive me to suicide because if I felt I don't really feel good, but I should have a smile on my face and enter a room, I'd realize um, I'm, I, I can't do it. I'd, I'd feel my inadequacy. So I think all this bullshitting yourself into feeling better than you do, which came from America. Finding ways to genuinely feel better. Yes. You know, it's not going straight away, but it's not. I'm saying like go and actively do something. Like, see, like the way in which you can activate. Well, we're talking about two different things. You can still activate when you're okay. When you're really in the state we're still discussing, and once you're in these illnesses, let it, drop the reins, you can't do anything. So, y yes, there is no guidebook for how we make our brains better. Everybody knows about doing sit-ups because most of the country are in the gym now, which is weird because when I got here 30 years ago, people weren't even brushing their teeth. <laughs> now everybody's in a, in, in, in a gym every day because they need a six-pack because they're all in a Lynx commercial. Everybody's in a gym. But the what's going to kill you is not how many, you know, how, how buff you are. What's going to kill you is that your brain's atrophied. Because we really take pride in saying, oh, she does that every day. Isn't that cute? She does. Granny always sits in that chair. You want to help Granny? Grab her out of the fucking chair and drop her from an airplane. That'll make her mind snappy. <laughs> you know, people have to understand that the brain, well, you know, now we're in my area, which I love, it changes all the time. And we really have much more control over breaking habits and rewiring than anybody ever thought. Th and that, since that science has given you that, and I can't find it. I mean, that's why I wrote my book. It's bite-sized, and probably a neuroscientist would go, I spit on this. But at least it's given you a suggestion of what the real story is. Now, somebody who waves crystals will say, I'm full of shit, because the fMRI scanner is telling you a lie. Well, then I say, don't read my book. Go back to the UFO. But I really think we don't know enough about our brains. I don't know where you are. And I think people need to be educated. I mean, the, you know, none, of, none of this is really rocket science. We know that uh, doing exercise does an awful lot of good in terms of the chemicals that flow around, you know, and they uh, get uh, uh, chemicals, good chemicals going and uh, uh, reduce... Uh, stress chemicals and so on and so forth. So, it's, none of that is really surprising. And uh, um, the surprising thing about it, um, uh, to me, um, is um, uh, that we allow each other, we allow people um, to suffer. But I'm, I'm most concerned about kids. If you're a, if you are um, a parent and your kid has high temperature and you don't do anything about it, then you start worrying you know, about the you know, neglect and social services and so on and so forth and people, the neighbors will start worrying. If your kid is anxious or depressed, does anybody, would anybody say you're emotionally neglecting your kid? No. Nah. You know, they'll grow out of it. And, and to me, that, that's really so, that we can ignore suffering in a particular, associated with a particular organ, the brain, that it, if it induces suffering in exactly the same areas, that the suffering doesn't change because it's in your body or it's in your mind. It's the same bit of the brain that does the suffering. But if, you, if, you, if it's the mind, we can just say, well, that, that'll change. It'll change. It's a, and that's really terrible. That, that to me is toxic. Isn't the problem with that example that often the parents can be one who they seem to be the blame for a lot of stuff like that? Like the better analogy would be to say that 
my mother's ghost. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm really pissed off. Yeah. <laughs> the parents like but I mean, yeah, I mean, that's fine. But what I'm saying is uh, that we are less willing to reach out to feel the way the other person feels in the case of mental distress or distress that's caused psychologically than in the case of physical distress. Uh, is what I'm saying. Because we probably because you can feel, you know, if you're near somebody, you can start to feel it. Whereas if they have shingles, I can't feel it anyway. So I can say, oh, that's too bad. But you know, we work may well like neural Wi-Fi. You know, human beings. I'll pick it up. You know, all you have to do is look at a movie, and everybody screams at once. If you're near someone, you'll pick it up, and maybe the last thing you want is to be in their presence because it passes. I can feel it, so I don't want to be near you. Well, as people used to run from cancer, thinking it's cancer. Yeah. You mentioned two things, really. One of them, you talked about the, um, uh, the evolution, and one you, you mentioned about the education. And I wonder if depression is a product of evolution. Because if you look back... Is, is, ever, is uh, depression a product of evolution? In the cave drawings. <laughs> I don't know. If, if you think about it in terms of the attachment, in terms of like, you know, Well, in, attitude, in Greek times, they talked, to, you know, they would talk about it. The, the depression has been around for a while, yes, uh, sure. But do you mean that, I mean, be, I, mean the, I, I don't want to be too certain, but I think my dog gets depressed sometimes. And I look at my dog, I mean, I don't, you know, I'm not so certain about it. But. Well, what I'm thinking is about, you know, our attitudes towards it, about the, um, you know, if you look at parenting over the ages, you know, we're becoming more susceptible to emotions now than we were in the Victorian ages. You know, children were there to be seen, not heard. And I wonder if, like, evolution itself has had a part to play in the problem of depression. You mean, you don't really mean evolution, you mean human culture changing. Yeah, okay, absolutely. The prevalence of some psychiatric disorders is increasing, but I think that's what Ruby was talking about as well. I mean, if you have a system that does not have a self-limiting block on stress, uh, that, you know, because it's... We can it's, work all yeah. night, yeah, we can work globally. I have to know what's going on in Ohio. But we were much healthier when I only knew what the neighbor was up to and who she was screwing. Once it's four doors down, I'm, I can't, I don't, why should I care? You know, none of us, we have to know what's going on. This is bad for our health. Because that's where our attention is. It's all over the place. We don't have the ability, you know, I talk about in my book, when I knew I was really bad, was when um, people, st my kids started to say, what was I like when I was growing up? And I can't remember, because I was on the phone the whole time. And they were trying to tell me that their hamster was dead. And I thought I got away with it. But to this day, they, were my, they thought I had a phone coming out of growing on my ear. And even at, once I was dressed as Santa, this is true, I had a speaker phone in the beard, <laughs> thinking they can't notice it. So um, that's that's because nobody, I couldn't stop. We're addicted. We ha we're carrying our own cocaine. You don't need to buy it. Dopamine tastes really good. And the more speed you get up, every alpha knows this, the more you want. Again, it's a gift, you know, for our survival. We need it, otherwise we wouldn't be sitting here. Elephants would be running the world. <clears throat> but the point is, it's too addictive. We can't stop it. So evolution, what, the, what it's given us as a gift, has screwed us also. And now we have to take this bigger brain that's sitting on the top and start to, you know, like the Wizard of Oz, take the handles and start maneuvering it around. Otherwise, we're finished. Because in 2020, they say that it's stress that's going to kill all of us. There's a cure for everything else. So there you go. I mean, it's, we have no choice. You know, th we're not just up here because we have nothing else to do. Um, anybody want to say anything even to each other? Hi. Um, isn't there many, too many types of depression like the, you were talking many about the environmental you know, experiences in your life? No, I'm not. No, no, there is no experiences in your life. No, depression is depression, but nobody knows whether you're born with it or whether 
uh, it's in your genes or whether it's something to develop, nobody knows. You can have, as I said before, maniacs. Is, Hitler could be your father and you're perfectly a lovely person. I, I think, you know, it's, it's not. I think that's, we used to think that, that there were two kinds of depression. They used to be called kind of endogenous and reactive or something, you know, these kind of things that just, it just happened and then things that were triggered. What we now know is that probably initially the triggers are really important, but then it, the, it's established in the brain and then everything can trigger it off. Uh, so, uh, uh, it's really more to do with where in the journey the person has through life that uh, you're looking at it, whether you, how you make the diagnosis. Most, it's, let's, I mean, it's, it's, that's a lovely, I mean, is it nature or nurture? I mean, what we now know is that genes are actually environmentally induced, okay? So that you know, genes get triggered by the environment. You know, a certain kind of environment triggers a certain kind of thing. To ask, is it nurture or nurture, is, is, it just doesn't, uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense. You in, inherit certain risks, but the, the main point is that we now know that there are certain things that are likely to make it worse. And uh, uh, for example, uh, one of the things that are likely to make it worse is if your mother, whilst you were in her womb, was stressed. Shit, that's my daughter down the toilet. <laughs> I, I, I hoped I wouldn't mention this. Uh, but you know, but if, if, you know, if, you've, if there's a lot of uh, cortisol going around the mother's uh, blood and that gets into the kid's brain, the kid's brains get organized for danger. There's danger out there. And th it'll be much easier for those things to be triggered. So that's environment, but it's actually happening intrauterine. Uh, so in trying to distinguish what is nature or nurture is really very difficult. And when you're particularly, you born a particular kind of person, you seek out a particular kinds of environment. It's an interaction of the two. A little bit is, yeah, but there's all the, it, it, is this going too moronic? There's, you get like a, a tens of thousands of genes, and some of them may be, have a proclivity for certain, let's say, a resilience or maybe anxiousness. But if they don't get switched on, if you're in an environment that's kind of, you know, loving and whatever, you can live with these genes. They don't get, they don't, they don't come alive. But, but, also, you see, but those you genes are there for a reason. Those genes are doing a good job. They prepare you for the environment that uh, you need to be prepared for. The problem is that there are false triggers uh, because the culture has sh changed and the things that trigger those genes uh, are things that were never supposed by evolution to be triggering those genes. That's really the problem. And we've got to engineer you the mean, environment. Like over yeah, and, exactly. And, yeah, yeah. Hyper the, the, but those things actually, in time past, when those genes were selected, they did a great job. Yeah. And that's what they made you hear. You know, I mean, that's the greatest thing. Imagine. Is it like because of that autoimmunity or kind of analogs to antibiotics? Because they're not I don't know. I mean, I, 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 I don't I'm not, uh, not entirely, f to be honest, I, maybe I'm just anxious, but I don't entirely follow your logic uh, about uh, autoimmunity. I mean, uh, uh, I think that in animals like, you know, apes, we found depression in animals, and we found depression I mean, nobody, it's very hard to give an ape a questionnaire and say, you know, uh, have you been feeling Anxious. Anxious or depressed. Or not. Yeah, but the thing with animals is that they feel every, every, everything has that, you know, that, that, that limbic system goes on. But because they can tear the enemy apart and eat it or whatever, <laughs> they can go back to grazing. The problem is when the, you know, 
the guy today pissed me off. I can't rip him to shreds. So I, you know, I just walk with the cortisol in my head. Again, no braking system. It was wonderful in yes. the past. It's terrible now. There's no outlet for some of I mean, us. The, the basically, what I think you're both saying is that there's a biological system that's not fit for purpose. That, there's you know, it should idea. really be revised. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, plead, you know, come on, give us a new system. Well, yeah. that, yeah. you know. Yeah. You know, I, I still think depression is similar to having any illness. It's got nothing to do with anything. Well, that's what I mean, though. That's what Sometimes I mean. there's not even triggers. It's not because my parents would... If I had three sisters, yeah, they'd yeah. be fine. It's a state of the brain. Yeah. Depression. That's what I meant, though. That's why people don't take it seriously. Yeah, well, we're back to that. Hi, Hi there. Um, first of all, disclosure, I've never suffered from depression, so this is highly illuminating for me, and I can't wait to buy and read your book, Ruby. Um, it's, by the, my book's not really about depression. <laughs> it isn't. There's 15 pages. Um, so it? as an outsider, the perception to me is the difference between something like cancer and mental health issues is cancer is something that we cannot control. It, it bombards us and affects our body. And whereas mental health issues is something, because as you say, your brain is the mothership, someone has me, um, a mental health issue or they, they don't, they've lost control and therefore there's an insecurity about them which is why people want to turn away. Can we not rebrand cancer and say well you know the brain controls the body but something else is controlling the brain. Can we not rebrand that? I mean the, 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 the paradox is that the mind is put in place so that it has the illusion that it's controlling itself. That's the, that's, that's the feature of the mind, you know, that's how it was invented, whoever invented it. Um, that, and we all have that, I mean, none of us are actually in reality in control, uh, but we all have the illusion that we are in control. So you, we all have decided to be here tonight, but do we really know why we're here tonight? My point is that's the stigma. <laughs> It's not the stigma, this is actually true. I mean, I wrote about it. If you really want to get into it, science fiction. Did, did I get an agreement from you just Yeah, I agree I, with I, you. I mean, the, this is virtual reality, really. You know, like even when you, when you look through the eyes, the sight isn't in your eyeballs. It's 70 different areas back here. I mean, I, neuro, this neuroscience is, is, it's fantastic because you realize everybody has it. And the encouraging thing, I'm going off your thing is that I may see him like that, but that's those, those are just my binoculars, you know. So every you can now start questioning your judgment that your lens is as tight as you want to make it. Again, we're back into neuroplasticity. So as much as you can be born with trauma, there is the possibility, and this is the good news, is that you can unwire and rewire again. You're not destined to how you were born. Now that may put more of a stigma on mental illness because that's sort of saying pull yourself out of it, in a sense. But on the other hand, we don't, you know, let's say Alzheimer's, you can't just think your way out of that. That is, do, do you see what I mean? I, I sound, do see what I, you mean. I now, it could sound like I'm contradicting myself. No, 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 it makes an awful lot of sense. I mean, what you're saying is, and I totally agree with you, that um, uh, people get better because their brain changes in yeah. structure, just the same way that people go worse because of their brain. You know, the, the brain is the organ of the mind. There's no other part of the body that really does a lot of work. In but if it can that. do such wiring, but, but it can really change. But it can change itself, and therefore it can change its contents. It can change the way yeah. it works, which is a marvelous thing. Uh, uh, and you can slow down. Interestingly enough, you can slow down the progress of. Uh, dementia and the progress of uh, Alzheimer's by actually being mentally active, which is why I'm here now, you know, I'm, uh, working and, you know. Yeah, but yeah. that's misunderstood too. You know, Carol yeah. Vorderman's suddenly going to tell you to play Sudoku, you know. Yeah. That's just like, again, you're exercising your little finger, you know, yeah, you still yeah, got the yeah, rest yeah. of the thing to move. Yeah. So, um, well, I, I still have depression. It's never going to go, but I was interested in this mindfulness. So, um, the reason I did it is because 
it's, I haven't had it in five years. I will have it again. Hopefully it's not tomorrow. But um, I, I started to get an episode, and this time I could hear it, I, the early warnings, like a tsunami. Now that doesn't mean it's not going to hit. It just means I can make preparations uh, where I didn't before. I, I don't have to call a shrink at 2 in the morning, but I know, whereas before I would have had a 1,000 dinner parties to show everybody I was fine, because again, that's a shame. I'm perfectly fine. So I take jobs I shouldn't have taken. I, I phone people. I didn't even know the people I was phoning. I got real busy. So um, now I know shut off all the lights, go somewhere, and make sure you wait till the cortisol levels come down. So this thing that's coming in the future is, and they're doing it with kids. Do you mind me just saying they're starting to teach, could be mindfulness, could be, let's call it anything, to kids, is that when the kid feels he has a temper tantrum, he holds up a red card, this is in some schools, and when he feels it coming down, he holds up a yellow card. So he's actually feeling his own, you know, we are a cocktail of chemicals. If you don't believe me, think about sex, and I'll give you a few minutes. You, you know, you are gauging this thing. They're teaching kids to, un to quit pointing and saying, he made me angry. He didn't, it's happening in you. So if you're in a business meeting and you start to lock antlers, People should understand, it's over. Your, your intelligence has gone down the tube. The minute we're out of our comfort zone, you know, the, and, the, and the height starts, we have to learn a way of regulating. Otherwise, war will, be, war will continue. The icebergs will melt. You know, it's in us. We can regulate this thing. Uh, so that's what I think is the hope of the future, is that we've got this prefrontal cortex that can really start to, you know, it is the Wizard of Oz, you can start to pull the dials, rearrange it, and it becomes the new habit. I'll still have those voices going, you're a fuck up, you're an idiot, you're a thing, but it's just, it's sort of like a radio in the other room, and it won't stop me from doing things that would have stopped me with fear. Because really? that's the enemy, if, is the If fear. I can just put that slightly differently, I, mean, I totally agree with you, but what you develop in, in, in therapy, but you don't, it doesn't have to be in therapy, is a capacity to represent your own, what's happening within your own mind uh, at a separate level from when it's happening. And as you have, as you're not uh, becoming it, but you can experience it. it at a distance. Yeah. So you, you have a represent, this is just happening to me, but it is not, doesn't have to carry me away with it. It doesn't have to be me. And there are lots of different ways of doing it. Mindfulness training is one. Talking to other people is another way of doing it. But basically what's happening is the same kind of mechanism. Uh, we call this mentalizing for once. It's another book, but we're not on sale here. He, that's, anyway. Uh, that's his that's book his, about yes, mentalizing. Exactly. Uh, anyway, but, 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 it's, but, but, but when Ruby talks about the prefrontal cortex, what it does is that rather than you simply experiencing things and being caught up with it and feeling that it's real, you say, it's just a thought. So, you know, this morning I looked into the mirror and I thought to myself, Fonagy, you really look very ugly. <laughs> and then, magically, I thought, I'm just thinking that. I don't really look ugly. <laughs> and I felt a lot better. <laughs> but can you believe, if, if I really believed it, how terrible I would feel now. Now when you're depressed, you don't have that capacity. You can't separate from the, you get caught up in the stream of those thoughts. And what we have to try and help people experience is use that capacity of the mind to separate a little bit from what's the stream that's going on underneath it. So when you're trying to understand your friends, the one, you know, the one in four with depression, uh, you know, uh, it's trying to kind of help them feel that it is not actually real what's happening in their minds, even though it feels more real than anything else that you could imagine. And that's where your block yeah. comes in. Yeah, but the, 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 you know they have these great metaphors. The thoughts yeah. aren't facts. Yeah, yeah, that I may feel I am I am not the essence of depression. There is depression, mm -hmm. and that little front of the brain at least gives you a gap. So you go, wait a minute, my feelings might not be, you know, the next guy. So maybe he isn't such an idiot. 
because I, I have an anger trigger that usually I want to attack when somebody does a certain thing. So now I can feel the early attack and kind of leave a little bit of a gap so I can make it, maybe, maybe I'm wrong, maybe this person doesn't deserve to be pounced on. And so as you do that, you rewire and you form a new habit. Doesn't mean I can't lose my temper, but it comes down much faster. And I'm not doing it because I care about the other person. I just don't think it's so much cortisol that I get the backwash. Anybody have questions? Sorry. Or Sorry. So do you think that the way to help men is how to teach them how to cope with the problems they have? The experience I have is that people that have it never goes away. They always have it. The way they can get through it is by learning and training themselves as a way of dealing with it. Exactly what you just said. Shifting the balance away from it being completely absorbing to being a tool that they can actually use to cope with the problems they have. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
the things that oh, I don't have it, so the stigma factor, that the person that this person's saying it to, that might have the fear of going, I don't want to be near you, it's the fear that, the knowledge that they probably have something in it themselves as a human frailty. Yeah, so it is the fact of like, almost just saying that everyone has the capacity, that they don't have this disease, everyone has an element in it themselves, everyone has it. Um. So it's, not, so it's a bit more of a unifier. I would say we have melancholia or we're, we have mourning. We all, you know, and that's the human, otherwise we wouldn't have art. Um, and we all have narcissism. And we, but, but let's remember, the real thing is like being, for me, you're pregnant or you're not. You know, there's a moment where we all have, uh, you know, cells that are dividing, but there's one moment it turns into cancer. And we don't all have that. So let's, let's distinguish serious illness from just being a little bit down in the dumps, or really down in the dumps. We're supposed to be like that. That's part of being human. But illness is illness, you know, where you don't know whether to kill yourself or go out and, for a jog. That's different. Nobody has that, except the one in four. Is there a physiological test? Well, usually they're sitting in a chair. Yeah, for a few days or months. I did. I sat there for five months. That's a good test. Anybody else? Yeah, hi. Do you, do you guys want to talk to each other? Or are you happy? I mean, you know, or do you want to throw it to us? Oh, okay. How about those who have I mean, those are concrete things, aren't they? I mean, because often people in those groups have depression. And actually, that's more the environmental depression, you know, not being understood or you know, not getting the right support. You see, I, I really worry about when you kind of say, but there's real depression and there's environmental depression. Um, you know, if, 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 you, uh, um, if you have a partner who you're deeply in love with and that partner says to you, I can't bear the sight of you anymore. I just want you to disappear from my life forever. That's environmental, but it's actually going to like hit you like a ton of, you know, it is just very, very, now, uh, the, why does it, it affects your brain. That's why it hits you, but everything that you experience affects your brain. So there isn't environmental, can't exist without the brain, if you see what I mean. That's media, that creates your experience, as Ruby was saying earlier. So there is ADHD, um, which is uh, uh, one of those other mental disorders. It's really interesting, ADHD. Very common, you know, uh, in childhood. And uh, you ask uh, a child psychiatrist how many of the uh, patients that you look after has ADHD, they'll say, well, it's about, you know, 15, 20%. You ask an adult psychiatrist, how many of the patients that you see have ADHD? I hardly see any. It's, it cures itself between, eight, between 17 and 11 months and 18. It just disappears. Now, what is actually happening is that those people who had been looked after as children because they had attention deficit disorder, suddenly stop getting looked after. And they get no care at all uh, within the adult system. Why is that? This is not kind of rocket science. It's just bad systems that we've created uh, for the managing of, of psychological problems. And we've moved away from uh, as, we're trying to look after a person, a human being, to a, a situation where we're looking, trying to look after a thing that they have. They have ADHD. Okay? That's a childhood disorder. It doesn't exist in them. Their brain just changes. It doesn't. So uh, what I think we have to be really careful about is um, uh, trying to recognize that actually something like 75% of mental disorder at age 28 was already there before age 18. It, you know, it, 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 most of it is there. It grows up with us. 
as our brain gets formed in relation to our families, our society, our school, all the different aspects of our lives. Our, you know, and the more stress you put on a child, the more their brain is going to react to it. I mean, I don't know whether they... Uh, how many... What do you think in the, currently in average North London school, what percentage of girls do you think harm themselves at the moment in the average North London school? What would you say? Harm them, cutting, you know. It's 20%. Now, when I was young, I, I did, you know, there are hardly any. You know, that's, that's, that, that speaks to what Ruby is saying, that we are creating an environment for our kids that actually is destroying their brains. And this, we are storing up this incredible time bomb for ourselves. But you know, as long as we ignore that there is a problem there uh, by, for example, making ADHD disappear at age 18, I think it's a, it's a risky thing. Oh. That's why I think it's really important as our world is kind of changing and we're making it way more stressful. I mean, it's essentially way more stressful to live in. We need to equip children with tools to be able to manage their world yeah. and how they are going to perceive it and how they're going to feel when they're in it. And even really simple things, like you're talking about the mindfulness in schools, we don't need millions and millions of pounds to fund research. We can just install systems in schools where they are able to um, teach children just simple things like being aware of what they're feeling and what that's called. You know, that a child is feeling angry and they're able to recognize that they're feeling angry and then able to maybe think as they get older why they're feeling angry. And it's about looking at themselves rather than we have a culture of kind of just throwing everything out and it's pointing a finger at everybody else and everybody else's fault. Whereas I suppose really simple things that schools can do, we unfortunately we don't. No. We really have a system. But it should be part of the curriculum. Uh, completely yeah. should be, because actually, if you can't manage yourself, then you can't manage your environment, and then you can't manage your learning, and then you can't manage Sure, because if you can't pay attention in your stress, the hippocampus, you know, where your part of your memory is, is uh, that's the first thing, isn't it? When the cortisol goes up, the, the memory goes down. So how are you supposed to learn in an environment where you're trying to get that grade because every other person is pushing for that? You, you can't. It's, again, this is brain science. You, it can't happen. Your memory's down because it's trying to remember, what did I do the last time I was in danger? Your brain, the blood leaves your brain because it goes to your arms because you're getting ready to, you know, rumble. Certain things happen. They, are, they happen. They're shutting down. Your digestion is shutting down when you're that stressful. So imagine what's going to happen to that kid in 30 years. Yeah, exactly. Ulcers, so diabetes, immune systems. Them. Yeah. So get them when they're young. Yeah. But I'm also thinking about what happens in families and how we also need supports for families because you can okay. try to teach a child in your school, but then they're going back into the family environment and there may be a lot of chaos and the things with ADHD and early trauma. So I'm really wondering around how we have to work systemically with families to keep children, uh, I don't know, safe and to develop in a way that's very, very safe and not cut off or not split from the classroom to the home. Well, that's your area. <laughs> yeah, no, but, but you just, yeah, but you just mean you think I've got a family. No, but you're, you, the, the, you, it's the only place where you can have family yeah. therapy, isn't it? Yeah, but it's, 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 yeah. We, we, do, we do quite a lot. But yeah, yeah, but I think we can all do better as parents, really. And I, and that's what I would, you know, we, I mean, what we do to, the, to our kids at the moment is just not fair. We, we, we take, you know, we put enormous pressure from, on them, and then we take all agency away from them. They were a lot better off when they were sent to be apprentices or whatever, because at least they had agency. But now, you know, we, we take every, you know, all the responsibility away from them and just say, well, you, but you better study, because your life depends on it. You know, if you don't sit this exam, then your life is got, you know. And in Korea, I mean, it, it started at age three. You know, they're putting pressure on kids. The highest suicide rate anywhere. It's not. It's not good. But uh, I don't know. I mean, 
quite a bit of social engineering that it'll require to take change every mum and every dad. Well, the irony is actually if you're going, the employers don't but the most mental of all are the CEOs you know which is in, we're living in an environment where it's actually an advantage to have Asperger's because you know emotions aren't going to get them down they can you know that's the queen bee it's like making the larva and everybody else around them, you know, screw them. And it, I almost think the 21st century, that's evolution. We've come up with Asperger's, and they're the only ones that are going to walk the earth, in a way. Yeah, because ev all this emotional shit is dragging us down. You know, if we could just dump it. But, you know, part of the thing with me being a parent is, thank God a shrink said you're mentally ill, so that I knew to marry somebody who could shield those kids so that I wouldn't, it wouldn't, you know, if it was passed, they wouldn't see it until they were old enough to deal with it. So I thank the, you know, the guy, Mark Collins, who said, you're, you're, you have clinical depression. Because otherwise I would have just thought, yeah, like my parents, my kid's misbehaving, I'm going to smack it across the head because I'm right. Now I know I have the instinct to smack, but I know that that's, you know, not the way to go. But boy, do I, f we feel it. We're still limbic, we're still animals. But then we have this higher brain where you can start again. You know, we're born with some real crap that will never go away, but you just learn to work under it a little bit. You know, everybody has their theme song. Some people are always feeling like the victim. Other people want to punch somebody. And part of this regulation is really learning what your theme song is and then still, still creating that distance, saying, this is what I would have done. You know, we're not all going into a Zen state. This is my, this is my, every nerve in my body wants to get back on that phone or make another deal, but I've got to pull a break here. What's your tipping point? If you could just learn that, I think we'd be healthier. You know, the next guy's going to flourish, but anyway, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I'm on the Oprah Hi. show. <laughs> Should we stop? Or anybody else want to say something? Yeah. Um, you mentioned, like, um, you know, how do you know you've got depression? So sort of sitting in a chair for five months is quite good. People kind of generally um, just sort of reject you. Do you have any evidence of you know, people not rejecting you and actually being able to help you in that situation you know, rather than the drugs and things? Is there any evidence that somebody being there for you? Well, a lot of caregivers in the second half of my show say, how do I help my child? She won't let me in the room. She's locked out. And I say again, start having meetings with other people in the same situation and come up with something. I mean, do, do you have any? Yeah. If you haven't got the illness, it, you can only love the person. But they may not want your help. I mean, it's, it's making one of the tragedies of mental illness is that you no longer see the other person's intention to help you so clearly. And what can happen is, and that's the source of the isolation that people can feel, that they feel they, they need help, and yet they don't see the other people as helping them. Uh, and uh, it, until they can relearn the language of relationships, uh, it's very, very tough to help them, and, and as uh, Ruby says, oftentimes relationships break down as a consequence. Staying with the person in that state and understanding that they are in that state is the best that you can do. I think you know, there's an awful lot else that can be done, but uh, I think putting all the pressure on that person is not right. What we know is that if that person is in a relationship, they're more likely to recover, and that if the relationship is good, they're more likely to recover more quickly. So how do you ensure if you're not the person with a mental health issue that you don't end up with a mental health issue from trying to manage the person with the mental health issue? Sometimes they do. Yeah. Exactly. They go mad. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, um, but still, I think for me, the most important takeaway from that is always that it's valuable to have the people there, even if initially you can't see them. Like from my obviously anecdotal experience with depression, 
Oh yeah, yeah. Even if they know they're on the other side of the door. Um, can I say? Oh, okay. We have to stop. Well, you can say a few other oh, things. Yeah. Okay, I've got to go to the bathroom. But um, it, it, if you, it, I'm selling my book, 10%. Go to the Anna Freud Center. I'd love it if you buy it. If you don't, well, steal one. It's and a fantastic <laughs> book. Let me just say, it's a fan it is a very, very, very good book. I kind of, I read it. I thought it was very, very good. Yeah, there he is. It, it, and and I have. Only a 10% stake. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I want to thank Peter. Thank yeah. you. And uh, maybe we could him. meet again. I want to thank Ruby. Come on, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> maybe we could have more meeting places. I hope we can. She's, she's doing more for people with mental disorder than, you know, 650 papers. <laughs> no, haven't, just haven't done it. No, but if we could have walk-in centers, you know, gradually, like in yeah. Leicester or wherever, I think that would make people, you know, feel part of the human race. So maybe we'll do it again. But then you could speak and have tea and meet. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much.